The F and Rad Snowboard Podcast is presented by Vans. Before I start the show, I just want to express how big a deal it was to visit the Burton headquarters in Burlington, Vermont. Todd Coleman took us through the museum and archives, and many of the staff who were working had their dogs with them at work. There was secret future stuff and so many priceless historical pieces like Brushy's dreads and all of Jake's kits from over the years, all the way back to the 70s even. I was like a kid in a candy store. Burton has helped shape snowboarding in pretty much every way possible over the past 45 years, and Donna Carpenter was there for all but two of them. I think it's time to start the show. Season 7 of F and Rad is sponsored by Wired Snowboards, The Boardroom Snowboard Shop, Anon Optics, Time Bomb Trading, and Tribute Board Shop in Nelson, BC. Anon Optics make goggles, helmets, apparel, and more. You can get Anon goggles in every color under the sun and lenses in more than 10 different tints. Anon pioneered magnetic lens technology for quick lens changes on hill, which is my favorite thing about my Anon goggles because I often ride at sunset and need a lighter lens at night. Anon offers pro models and artist series goggles for both men and women. Plus, you can get full coverage and complete protection from wind, sun, and cold with Anon's goggle helmet face mask seamless kits. I mostly rode the Helix last year, and I have a pair of M4s I saved for those special deep days out on the snowmobile. Check out Anon at your local snowboard shop, or see the full collection at Burton.com. Support for Season 7 also comes from Grouse Mountain, Mount Seymour, New Greens, GoPro, and Volcom Outerwear. Thanks to everyone who supports the show. Donna Carpenter is the owner of Burton Snowboards. She served as the CEO from 2016 to 2020, and in 2018, Burton became a certified B Corporation, committed to balancing profits with purpose, as you'll hear in this interview. Donna set up Burton's distribution channels in Europe in the 80s and became the company's CFO in 1989. She's on the Forbes list of self-made women of 2021. I'm honored to have her on the show. Here's my interview with the one and only Donna Carpenter. I've always felt a debt of gratitude to Jake for what he's done, always. And then I heard an interview with you, a podcast, where you talked about his last words. And of all the Donna stuff I've listened to over the last month, that's the sticking point for me. I just, I have an impossible time not being moved by by what that is. So let's come back to that at the end. I think. But mm-hmm. <laughs> for now, this is an interview about Donna Carpenter. And I'd love to ask you about your life pre-Jake. So you grew up in New England? I did. I'm actually from a small town in East Texas. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah. Believe it or not. (laughs) And when I was four years old, my, my father got a job in New York City. And my mother refused to move the family there because she was not going to raise Yankee children and... Um, you know, my grandmother said we couldn't move there because that's where the devil lived. I love that so um, much. But when I was eight, we did, and we moved to a wealthy suburb of New York. So I think I always felt tribeless, like I didn't belong in Greenwich, Connecticut, mm-hmm. but I also didn't belong in Nacogdoches, Texas anymore. Right, right. You know, and I was a rebel. You know, I caused um, trouble and left home um, very young when I was like 16, got into a lot of trouble. (laughs) So you took a gap year and went to to France, right? Mm -hmm. And and while you're in France, you got into trouble? I got into trouble. (laughs) How much trouble could a 16-year-old get into? I got into trouble. I got, (laughs) let's see, I got arrested for wearing a gold belt and gold sandals. What? And that's all I was wearing. (laughs) I got into trouble. And then I came back and I was 18 and I was really kind of ready to go to college and be a little more serious and get my shit together. And that's when I met Jake. And I thought, here's a fellow rebel who's going against the grain, and he doesn't care about material things. 
Um, was, like, there, was there a lot of materialism? Like in, in Greenwich. Yeah, of course. Yeah, and when you're not from there and you're seeing it kind of from a small Texas town point of view, you're like, this is fucking nuts, you know? Yeah. And I knew I didn't want that. Um, and I met this incredibly decent, hardworking, but incredibly fun guy. What was he like? So I, I've heard the story. You know, it's New Year's Eve. And I'm not sure if you're at a ski hill or just a bar. No, we're at a bar, the mill in Londonderry, Vermont. Okay. I was skiing at Stratton. He was coming out of the men's room. Yeah. And we kind of caught each other's eye. And he said, can I buy you a drink? And I said, come on, you can do better than that. Nice, <laughs> nice. Nice. And so it really just started as, you know, fun on a weekend while I was living in New York and, and visiting. And right away, he identified as a snowboarder. My name is Jake, and I make snowboards. That's amazing. Um, and our first date, why I why there was a second date, I don't know. But <laughs> the, the first date, he took me to a high school basketball game. What? No skin in the game, no nothing. He just loved sports. You know, he had a pure love of sports. Yep. Football, baseball, basketball, playing sports, watching sports. And then we went out to dinner and I could see he was kind of falling asleep. He he was a hard worker at that time. He really like was putting in the hours. And he seemed a little bored. And so I said, "Well, show me this stupid snowboarding thing." <laughs> And so we went up and at night after dinner. Yeah. And he said that would that's what hooked him. I, I that said, you okay. went. That I said, yeah, let me see this thing. So what did he show you? Did he take you to the factory or did he take you no, out snowboarding? No, he took me out snowboarding. Oh, come on. And we drove up to um, halfway up Stratton. I went and got a pair of high top sneakers. And I remember it had the rope on the end and the straps for your feet. And I fell and the board went flying. <laughs> And Jake said, here, take my board and put it exactly where you were and where you fell. And he ran, and it landed within a foot Whoa. of my board. Yeah, I was like, whoa, that's impressive. Yeah, that is impressive. That cool. Nice move. <laughs> <laughs> it was a good move. That's so dope. And so were you hooked on snowboarding at the time, or was it something that you were like, okay, I'm dating a snowboarder, whatever that is? Whatever that is. And it really, you know, the it was never going to be at a ski area, right? It right. was really an alternative to that. At the time, yeah. there was the oil crisis, really expensive to get to ski areas. It was costing more and more. So this was really conceived as a back hill Right. Backyard sport. That blows my mind because Jake's got the credit for opening ski resorts. I've I've spoken with people that went with him to ski resorts and he talked to the GMs and he said, Look, we can we can stop, we can we we tick all the boxes. There's no reason not to have us here. You know what? It always starts with the athletes. We had a couple of kids mm -hmm. working for us, Andy Coglin and yeah. Mark Heingartner. Rad. And they were used to going to ski areas, and they would say to Jake, "Hey, let's." There was a way you could drive about halfway up Bromley, yep, and then snowboard down, and we would do these shuttle runs. Rad. So it really was like the kids working for him because he was really happy hiking. Mm -hmm. Well, his his background, and I don't want to do the whole interview about Jake, mm. but I mean, I'm so fascinated <laughs> to have you here and have that that knowledge as well. When I talked to Sherman Poppin, Sherman was really quick to say, Jake came to one of our events, right, in Muskegon, and they had to make a special category for him because he had bindings on the board, and neither of them could really see snowboarding at that point. I think Jake saw a sport. Did he? I think he did. Yeah. I think he's like, this is too fucking fun right. not to be right. a sport. Yeah, because it was kind of a kid's thing with Sherman, right? Right. Like, I grew up taking them sledding. Yeah, exactly. In the 60s in, sure. in Connecticut. We of would course. take our snurfer with us. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Right. And then you try and stand up and it was almost impossible. Yeah. I mean, I think really great entrepreneurs, they don't come up with ideas out of the blue, right? Like Chuck Barfoot 
and yep. Tom Sims, you know, they, you know trying I to get lo- trying lo- to spit that one out of my mouth. <laughs> it's really it hard. Brings- it's still hard. <laughs> yes, I hate to speak <laughs> ill of the dead, but no, I hear you. <laughs> so yeah. It was sort of the concept was there, like, oh my God, surfing mm-hmm. on snow, that feeling of standing sideways on snow. Well, let's talk about Dimitri because Jake, you know, tipped his hat to Dimitri for sure. And by all accounts, Dimitri had a, a, a snowboard that he was snowboarding on in the early 70s. Yeah, and everybody was coming at it differently, yeah. right? He was yeah. in the backcountry of Utah. Exactly. Jake's on the East Coast where it's icy and mm-hmm. whatever. And yeah. Tom's obviously very influenced by skateboarding. Yeah. So you have all these guys around the same time who are coming at it in different ways. And I think Jake really appreciated that about all of them. I think you know? so, too. I yeah. think that came across in his life that he definitely, you know, gave credit where it was due. There is a little bit of the Utah thing that got cut out of history because when you actually partner up Sherman and the through line with Jake, you get 69 is the start date. Oh. Whereas Dimitri 71... And he's kind of on the side, but he is doing way more advanced snowboarding in the 70s than anybody in the world. Like, he goes over to Europe. He gets, you know, Regis Roland Hook, who's another pioneer of the sport. This Like, it's such a colorful character and an amazing person. And they were at Alta, 79, 80, and 81, riding the lifts. Yeah. Like, come on. Like, there's not even a Burton board at that time that could handle riding yeah, the lifts. Yeah, they probably didn't even, you know, resist. They're probably like, whatever's Whatever. under me, yeah, go yeah, ahead. Yeah. And then I think the same guy still at Alta now that was like, no, you guys are banned because they probably didn't listen very well. Or and I think that's why snowboarding became such a strong community because it didn't matter what board was on your feet, mm-hmm. really. Like, we were all fighting to get on the lifts and to totally. progress the sport. And so there's always been that sense of we're in it together. Right. Absolutely. You know, seeing a snowboarder at a ski resort. You'd know them. Yeah. You'd either know them or you were you knew you'd know them by the end of the day. Yeah. Like, you know, so the first few years you're um, working with Jake, you're actually helping him out, right? Like, do you have a day job and then you're dipping boards in that old factory at yeah, night? Yeah, well, that was, yeah, I was helping him out on the weekends and stuff. And yeah. then... Um, Right after we got married, I think I had a little culture shock moving to Vermont. And I was like, oh, my God, what am I going to do? And it's right when Jake started thinking that a snowboard could be made like a ski, that if we could somehow steal skiing's technology, right, we could really progress the sport. So it's funny. It was the first year after we were married, um, we couldn't have afforded to go over to Europe. You know, the company was growing and we were, you know, had begged, borrowed and stolen to, to keep the company going in the early startup phases. But my parents were going to Europe on a ski vacation and they invited us. Um, in the Alberg, Western Austria. Sweet. And Jake made appointments to visit six or seven ski factories. And like, will you make this? Will you make this? And they all said, no, (laughs) you're out of your mind. We'd have to change, you know, the whole size of a press and how all the tooling is set up. And he had one last appointment in uh, outside of Salzburg, Austria, and he got there during a snowstorm at midnight, and they had to wake the uh, owner's daughter to translate. <laughs> wow. And this guy said, yeah, I can do it. And so Jake worked with him, and you know they're now the largest producer of snowboards in the world. So this is a 40-year mm-hmm. partnership. Mm-hmm. Were they the first outside factory, outside of... Mm-hmm. And so they made those safaris or something? What would they oh, have made? Oh, it was probably even before that, the even elites. Before. Elites, right, yeah. right. Wow. So Jake said, hey, I want to go over and really focus on this production. I think it's game-changing. Yeah. And I actually had another job lined up with a, uh organization out of Vermont called The Experiment in International Living. And I was going to be recruiting Austrian students to come study in the U.S. and vice versa. And right before we were leaving, Jake said I was 22 
And Jake said, hey, could you take a look at some of these inquiries? Like people in Europe are starting to ask for the snowboard. And the next thing I knew, I was setting up an office and starting to set up distributors and meet like-minded people. And, and it wasn't, you know, disallowed in Europe. Right. There is no liability no. issues over there. <laughs> so you could go anywhere and take it anywhere. And it really exploded. So there was, there was an explosion in Europe before the American yeah, one or well, kind America, of in tandem? Yeah, yeah, in tandem. Yeah. And then I would say, you know, mid 80s, we were focused over there. You know, if you look at our boards, they go from being black <laughs> yeah. and gray yeah, to absolutely. being like neon and yellow. That's the European influence. The, you so know? the board that I saw the drawings for at the flagship store downtown, in the, that's one of Jake's actual notebooks, right? Yeah. So those notebooks started right yeah. away like right at the beginning of of burton yep like he's just because mike rank would told me you know you'd be in a helicopter with jake you're riding from some other team and there's some little neat knickknack that you've come up with on your boot or like a way to tie your you know like why do you have zips zip ties on your zippers or whatever and mike's like well so they don't blow open of course out comes Jake's yep. <laughs> book, and Jake will be like, huh, this is interesting. You know, he was a product guy at heart. Yes. I mean, a product nerd. Yes. I mean, he nerded out on every single product. He would try every single men's jacket, every single men's board every year. That was his, he just loved doing it. He loved doing oh, it. Oh, that's so rad. That's so fun. So the Europe years... You guys don't have kids yet. Mm -mm. And the business is actually, is it booming? It's is it, booming. Is it taking up 100% of your time or are you able oh, to kind of? Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, so yeah. you're not over there just like no, enjoying no, Europe. No, 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 no. <laughs> it was insane. And yeah. it was growing up over 100% a year. That's nuts. And we're taking on European athletes. Right, and we're starting to organize European events. Who were the first Euro guys that were on the team? Uh, you oh, you know uh, Pietro Colturi, who's still uh, our our rep in Italy. So red <laughs> after all these years. Wow. Um, I don't know if you know Gerfried Schuler, who started Blue Tomato. No. He was he was on uh, the first team there, and I remember uh, one of my jobs in the very beginning was European team manager. I managed these guys, and we had a uh, international riders camp. So this is probably like eighty seven or something. Yeah. And we had them all come, and it was kind of the f model of the first rider roundtable. Oh, that's amazing. In 87. So this is pre-Craig. No, the Craig was there. Well, so that was it Craig's was like first, right, the his first, first thing. Yeah, because yeah, I talked with Jacoby about when Jacoby got on the team. So Mike sends a board, and this story happens a lot. Mike sends a board to Burton because he broke it. He's riding it a lot. And he gets another board. And then he sends that one back after he breaks it a couple of months later or whatever and says, you know, maybe you should send me two because I'm riding them a lot and it takes a month for me to send it back from Colorado or wherever he's living at the time. I think he was in Idaho or Wyoming. And Jake sends him two, actually, and then says, like, hey, would you like to help us design these, make these work better? And Jacoby's like, And I remember I think Jacoby so. was at that thing. Oh, was he? Oh, yeah, yeah, was, of course. Of yeah, because yes. uh, there was a great line when Jacoby gets over to Austria and he says, Jake, they don't speak American. <laughs> <laughs> I love Mike so much. Unbelievable. <laughs> and we're like, no, Mike, they don't speak American. So he was surprised because, uh, so he's at that age, he's 17, 18, he's thinking about going to college. And he's telling his dad, like, hey, you know what? Burton is offering to pay for me to be on the team, but I really think I should go to college because, like, this is – like, like we – I remember feeling that, like, being like, I got to give up skateboarding. I got to give up snowboarding. I'm going to be a dad. I, I need to grow up and be a adult. I need to be adulting. And his dad said, Mike, you can do this for a few years and then go to school. You don't have to go to school right now. 
And he's like, okay, but meanwhile, you guys are offering him money. And he's saying, uh, I don't know. And then you're offering him a little bit more money. So did money. the beginning yeah. of, of people being able to make a living. Yeah, yeah. So he thinks his contract was more than it should have been just because he was <laughs> because he was like contemplating it. And then he tells me, as soon as he signed the contract and made that decision, you guys flew him to Europe. And that's this... That's this time mm -hmm. where he's there with Craig. He said he was surprised and to Peter see Craig Bauer there. And yep, Peter Bauer and John. Irma. Oh, that's so sweet. <laughs> yeah, and Craig coming to the team would have been, you know, it was a surprise for Jacoby because here's this, you know, Sims guy, and that just throws everything into disarray. For was it right away with Craig's contract with Sims, or was it a, a, a 88 or something? It was probably about a year later or something. Yeah, yeah. I don't remember the okay. whole timing. I do remember it was Craig who approached me at a U.S. Open and said, hey, do you think you and Jake would be open to talking to me about riding for you? And I was like, okay, play this really cool. <laughs> like, like, oh my God, yes, I, I think so, you know. Do you remember Burton at that time flailing a little bit with with Tom just having that huge team of just everybody for freestyle and you guys being Yeah, we were New sort England. of waking up and going, oh shit, yeah. this is the direction the sport's going and mm -hmm. we didn't see it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'd call it our first oh shit moment. Yeah, you need those. And you need those. Yeah. And Jake would be the first to say, hey guys, we're, we're heading in the wrong direction. We need to turn it around. And Craig was there to help us turn it around. Yeah. And, you know, he was very intense. I mean, I remember him saying explicitly to Jake, I'll ride for you, but you got to listen to me. Mm -hmm. It's a big deal. And that's a big deal for an entrepreneur like Jake, who's not used to listening to anybody. He had his <laughs> notebooks. Right, right. He had his lists. Yeah. He had shit to do. He had shit to get done. And this kid's going to tell him how to build a and board. And he was a kid. Yeah. He was like a little kid. He's 18 or something. He was small. Yeah. Yeah. But Jake made that commitment to him right then and there. And Smart said, move. Um, all right. Yeah. Yeah. That's just incredible. <laughs> Everybody's always called it the Sims versus Burton thing. But I really think that it was Brad versus Craig. Like it was like Craig had sat in Brad's office and said, uh, I don't know. It was uh, Tom did it to Craig. You know, he he told Craig, sign this contract. Yeah. It's a lifetime service <laughs> contract oh, to me. Oh, so no matter oh, who I sell my oh, company to, oh. you have a lifetime contract with me. And I'm not putting you on the plane to the U.S. Open until you sign it. Wow. And so that's called forcing someone to sign a contract under duress. Of course. And so when Craig came to us, we said, that sounds illegal. Totally. Um, and we'll help you fight it. I, I talked to Judge Ferris. What, a, oh, really? what an amazing human being. <laughs> and he didn't remember the case, but he brought up his case file. And he goes, oh, yeah, I seem to remember they were just trying to punish this guy, which isn't really something punishable by law. Like they weren't on the right side of the law. No, yeah. And, and so we let him ride the boards. I was like, dude, you were a part of such a historic moment in snowboard history. Kelly Joe told me that she remembered being thrown out of court because she would stand up and say, that's bullshit. You know it, you know. And they're like, what is going on here? I think at one point, Craig's nose started bleeding, too. And uh, Jake's like, oh, my God, they think we're cokeheads. <laughs> The judge is going to think we're cokeheads. I remember that. I'm like, no, they're not. <laughs> oh my God, that's incredible. Because the first judge was like, you're all a bunch of derelicts. Get out of my court. Like all of you. <laughs> all like, of you. Yeah. All of you. I'm not distinguishing between. And that's like, you're like, oh, my God, that's so wrong. But that's why the appeal was so quick. Oh, that's good. That's yeah. good. So around that time. Craig actually forges his friendship with Jacques Rousseau. Mm -hmm. Jacques was just looking for a champion. He found it in Craig. They lived close enough together that Jacques could just drive down to his house. And so when I was talking with Jacques, he, he said that he came to interview Jake for Let It Ride and got thrown out of the office. Because he because he was like, I interviewed Tom and I interviewed... And Jake was just like, wait, you interviewed Tom for... Like, get the hell out of here. And what... Jacques said, and I can cut this whole thing out if it is no, controversial. No. <laughs> he basically said that back at the, I, I don't know if it was the 85 or 84 Worlds, Tom 
assured Jake, no freestyle. There's not going to be any freestyle. Don't bring your boards. Don't worry about it. And then when Jake showed up, there was a, a half pipe. And basically, for the rest of his life, he was like, oh, you double-crossing son of a bitch. Like, I hate that guy. Tom was not the most ethical guy or whatever, but the biggest lesson I learned from Jake, I had a situation where I was at a trade show in uh, Europe, and the Sims people had taken our catalog word for word and put their name in it. And I'm like, this is copyright infringement. This is like everything. And I was furious. And I'm like, I'm going to a lawyer. And Jake sat me down and said, don't spend your energy going after. Let's kick his ass in the market. Mm -hmm. Let's make a better product. Mm -hmm. Let's have a better team. And Jake would take the high road that way and knew it made Burton a better business absolutely because we had somebody who's really pushing it and he really admired Tom's ability to design a snowboard and shape a snowboard that and F-E- under oof. and understand like what shapes were coming you know yeah and yeah but he wasn't the most ethical business guy he really wasn't I mean you know the story about how he would set courses yeah 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 ten he, ox, he, ten ox totally. he yeah. would turn yeah and then he'd say put the flags where i just turned yeah you know and everybody's like wait tom you can't do that and he's like yeah i can on top of that then he would magically draw bib number one yeah. which allows oh, him yeah. to have the course so, unadulterated and yeah. then win the thing and then you guys have to go back with the burton team going you know, okay, we got second and third or whatever it was. And at the time, the boards, that there is that one. I didn't realize this because I started in 88, 89. You don't look back. At 88, right. 89, you're looking at what's coming out in 1990. Right. And, and I heard, you know, in 93, I remember hearing, Burton's already working on 95. Like they've got 94 dialed in already. They're already two years ahead. I remember just being blown away by that. <laughs> But having gone back with the podcast and finding out that, okay, the Sims FE 1500 or the FE series was blowing Burton stuff out of the water at yeah. the time. Like it would have been a big push. That was always my, um, like what I guessed was that Craig came over and brought that information about the FE. Like th- this is what works about this. And, and on- this is where the sport's going. People want to be able to go right. forwards and backwards right. as well. And this is where it's going. It's not going in this direction. And that was Craig's genius all yes. along. Yeah. Of um, anticipating where the sport was going to go. He, uh, by all accounts, Craig lived snowboarding probably more than anyone else on the planet at that time. And Jake lived snowboarding probably more than anyone on the planet at that time. Those two together would have been, you know, a business partnership and a friendship that would have just been And that love amazing. of product. You oh, know? yeah, they both had they the design They just shared mind. that and could spend hours, you know, looking at a binding. Was was Craig a little bit annoying with his, you know, having his sister cut out his clippings and say, you know, I got the Burton base on the on television. Here's my like for photo incentives and and because he wrote an incredible contract, right? Yeah, and I think that that was uh, Jake very much believed. We believed in that incentive structure. Cool. And Craig was the perfect person to pioneer that right Mm -hmm. like you get more exposure you're going to get paid more so no that was really like a win-win cool really felt like yeah there was never there was never a time where you guys are looking at the accounting going okay craig's making more than the entire company uh maybe we need to or we just need to keep designing we need to keep growing we need to do our the back end to support the fact that Craig's blowing up. And after Craig, Jake just believed it was the writers who were going to tell us where the sport was going and what we needed to do. Incredible. Yeah. So, yeah. It was the lesson. It was the oh shit moment. It was, and and there we had somebody who could not only help us see it, but help us <laughs> move past it. Yeah. By developing great product. What was it like when he decided he wasn't going to compete anymore? Do you remember that? I, I remember that like it was yesterday. I remember him coming to us and we're thinking, okay, what's, you know, is he going to want more money? It's because he was literally at the very top of his career. Absolutely. And he said, I don't want to compete anymore. I want to film. And, uh, you know, Jake 
and I, we had to say, okay, we can't just listen when we want to want to or when we're hearing what we want to hear. We've really got to listen to him now. We think he's wrong. Absolutely. But we made a commitment to let him take his career where he wanted to, and he was fucking right. He was right. Yeah. How, how crazy is that? Yeah. It felt so It was wrong. not an easy business decision, and it was not, but it really came back to that, you know, Craig coming to us and saying, I'll ride for you if you listen to me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's a deal we're making. That's insane. Yeah. Because I rode with him the year that he had the, I think it's the tree board, whatever had the black top sheet. I remember being such a dumb kid and being at Mount Baker and being like, that's Craig Kelly. I'm with my three buddies. I'm like, let's go up with them. It's a four person Mm -hmm. chair. And I scooched up beside him, but my friends stayed back because they were like, are you kidding? You don't just ride up the chair with Craig Kelly. He probably loved it. Oh, he, he loved talking about the specs of his board. This is what happened. I first I flubbed it because I was like, oh, it's cool that you're still on Burton, even though you're not the champion anymore or whatever, you know, like, oh, you don't you don't compete anymore. I wonder what happened there. But he goes, look, Jake told me personally, as long as I'm snowboarding, I'm riding for Burton. And I was like, why would he say that? That's crazy, because I had no idea how big of a deal Craig Kelly was to me. He was last year. You know what I mean? I remember even saying to Kelly Joe down in, in uh, Oregon, oh, it's great that the old timers can still get out there. Craig was probably 27 or something. <laughs> like really feeling like I put my foot in my mouth. He's like the old guy. He kind of quit with his tail between his legs is what I felt. And then the rebirth of Craig in the backcountry, Craig as the guru, the slowed down, don't take yourself as seriously as, you know, I think his mom told me, he, before contests, when he was competing, he would take every piece of his binding off and he would check that every screw had Loctite, that there was no cracks in any of the holes. And he didn't want I anything would say to he fail. was doing that while everybody was downstairs partying. Yeah, yeah. The he night was, before he was upstairs yeah. doing that. He was taking it that seriously that mm-hmm. he wanted to win. That's where the mutual respect came from between the two of them is how seriously Craig took it and took the product and making it, you know, wanting it to be a better product. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, he, I mean, his his friend um, Jeffrey Kruger from, from school talked about how it was unbelievable that he could get the grades he got at school considering how much he would just go snowboarding. Like <laughs> snowboarding was he's the same. He's a smart guy. Oh, he's Fucking brilliant. Smart guy. Olivia's, that, she totally. has that, hey? Totally. She has that. And you they totally both have it. this certain look where you <laughs> like, okay, I'm stupid in your presence. I know I am. Oh, man. I've, I could talk Craig Kelly stuff all day. <laughs> like, if we're at Craig, the next thing on the timeline is basically, and it's so cool that you managed the European team and then you were just a part of the, fa- the the family run business, which is Burton, like the U.S. Open and everything coming back. When do you come back full time? Yeah, to- you know, and it was really Jake. I always say who pushed me every step of the way. I never imagined what I would be doing for this company, and he's like, you know, you should run Europe. And I'm like, I'm 22 <laughs> years old. I have no idea what I'm doing. I like to say that's probably why we were so successful because we had a real sense of humility of like, hey, teach us what this is all about, you know, teach us how to do business in Europe. Um, So we always had a sense of humility because we had no idea what we were doing. And then when we came back, I was starting to have kids and I really didn't know what I was going to do. And Jake said, you know, we really need, so this is in the late 80s, he said, we really need a CFO. And I said, I can't be CFO of this company. And he said, you just spent five years running Europe. You know how to do budgets, forecasts. You know, you've been doing it. Why Mm -hmm. can't you do it here? So it was every step where he said, oh, yeah, you can do that. I always say he was my biggest cheerleader. Do you think that that was something he thought about and planned out? Or do you think that was something that he just was like, she's got it handled? 
So I, I think yeah. you would see a need f- in the business. You know, we didn't mm-hmm. know we were going to be selling product in Europe. We thought we were going to be there manufacturing product. Mm-hmm. But then all of a sudden it's like, hey, you could help here. Mm-hmm. And then same thing coming back to the States. Like, you know, you have financial experience. You could do this. You know, there was always a stretch for me. And um, that was a very <clears throat> interesting time. I think I always say that that's when I learned that Burton was really a family. And it was the late 80s, and we were growing quickly. We were doing well. We didn't have a lot of financial systems in place. That's what I was coming in to do. But we were doing just fine. And uh, there was the savings and loan banking crisis in 1989 and our bank we we have never had any long-term debt we've never had any partners equity partners but we have to borrow short term and i had negotiated at cfo i was so cocky i had negotiated (laughs) this great deal and I had to show a profit, we had to show a profit, and I had to not borrow for a period of 30 days. Well, I didn't borrow for a period of 45 days, and I'm all proud of myself. And I pick up the phone and I say to the bank, okay, I need the money. And they said, we need to talk. We're getting rid of your loan. Oh. And we're a $20 billion bank, and we want to be a $10 billion bank, and we're getting rid of any loan we consider risky, we consider you risky. And I was like, we complied with everything you asked us to comply to. Didn't matter. I had to walk around to 50 employees in Manchester and say, you know that paycheck you got? It's not worth the paper it's printed on. Oh, no. Could you hang on to it? And to a person, nobody left and nobody complained. And I mean, I remember single moms with kids in daycare, and they would say to me, we know this is happening through no fault of the company. Let us know when you get emergency funding. That's insane. And it was about two and a half weeks. Wow. And I always say that was the moment where I realized, like, you can say you have a family when everything's groovy and cool, but when the shit hits the fan, that's when you know that it's more than employees. Oh, that's so sweet. (laughs) So how do you how do you secure financing just by skipping to another bank that has a better handle on reality? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we had to put up collateral. My family had to put up collateral. We said, you know, we'll promise everything. Our firstborn children. No, not quite that bad. But (laughs) yeah, and you make a deal, and you make a more expensive deal. Yeah. So you're ten years in at this point. Was there any point where you were looking at it going, you know, maybe we should just get like day jobs, you know? You know, right then, I think right at that moment, Jake had a moment where he was like, I don't know if I could keep doing this. I don't know if I can, you know, you put your heart and soul into it and you might not get the capital that you need to get through the season, Mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Um, I always say we we never felt that way together. (laughs) So luckily, like, I'd be like, you don't want to sell it. It's our baby. I don't think we ever would have. But there were times like that, you know. And what happens is you go from being this is about me and Jake to this is about these people and their livelihoods and their children and yeah. <laughs> their sense of well-being. Like, Jake and I will land on our feet, but we've, we're responsible for these people. So... It goes both ways. Like, they've got the loyalty to us, but we've got that incredible responsibility to them. There was a, I'm, I'm wondering what the product was at that time. Like, because it was so exciting to go to the trade shows or get the, you know, before I went to the trade shows, get the catalog and see what has changed, right? Like, so it would have been so exciting as a company to be like, we need to get this out to the world because we've, 
we've collaborated with such great writers and come up with great with great designs through great designers. And I think that's what was so frustrating, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. oh yeah, you're growing and you're being innovated, and but we're not going to lend you money. That's so because bizarre. we think you're a fad like the hula hoop, or we just don't think that this is long term sustainable. Yeah, it's hard to it's hard to remember what it was like when being a snowboarder was to be a bit subversive. Yeah, like even at the resort. Yeah, it, it was like. Oh, you're one of those. You really felt like you were outside of, I mean, you know, we shouldn't have been at the resorts riding on snow making hoses and sliding on the roofs of their houses and, you know. I don't know. <laughs> I feel like snowboarders brought that fresh perspective that is to true. the mountain. Jumping like, in the air. To look at something and say, what if yeah, I did yeah, this? And I true. think about that like being Craig's spirit too. Absolutely. Of, of you know the whole mountain and using the whole mountain and using your imagination and creativity i love that snowboarding brought that to winter sports you know what that's totally true and sometimes i couldn't quite understand when they slid across a picnic table and your <laughs> yeah. lunch would go flying <laughs> <laughs> yeah totally <laughs> so 1990 those early years of pro models right like the brushy terrier's board like you guys are are now far and away there's no more like sims burton what's which is going to be which i mean maybe a little with the slaz board but sims was was petering out they were going through you know another uh, and, yeah and they had and been then bought Umbro. by vision yeah and, and then yeah yeah. So, yeah so like they it it seemed very unstable i don't know what it was but i can tell you that burton was just obviously a clear leader by the ketchup mustard in the next year and what's crazy by that time we're truly international in the late 80s. Think That's about nuts. that. I mean, we are full on in Europe because Jake and I live there and we had, um, you know, passionate people in, in representing us in Japan. So we are oh, yeah. full on global at this point. And, it, and that's what it feels like. It feels like a global community. Mm -hmm. That's incredible. So does that um, rider roundtable thing grow and improve every year like because because the business is cyclical right how soon are you in like <laughs> australia new zealand and 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 like the endless winter thing? yeah so yeah you could do that early? but your major markets yeah. are are going to be cyclical or whatever and the business model used to be a lot easier than it is today. It used to be that you would go to a trade show, you would show your stuff, your dealers would place an order, and you would place an order with your factories, and Jake would do a catalog, and you'd ship the product, you yep. know? And um, it, it was kind of... And, and then, so it was very clear of when you would bring the athletes in. And Jake would have them look at every single product they looked at everything and mm -hmm. they tried everything um and you know over the years it expanded to where they're looking at product maybe different times of the year where we're getting them involved in in marketing at different times of year but he still we always had that physical get together usually in may um away from the office where everybody can really just immerse themselves in getting to know the athletes and uh, hearing their opinions. Yeah, they're important, right? Like uh, the intern Josh was talking about, you know, my, one of my favorite pieces is a Burton uh, camera bag. And I'm like, in my mind, I'm, I'm reverse engineering how that came to be. Right. It's like Jake is sitting probably with Blotto or somebody going, why don't you have a Burton camera bag? And Dean says, well, this is, I need this and this and this and this. And Jake goes and buys two of those bags and says, let's make a better one of these. Like, this is the best. I think it's the way we really built trust with them, mm -hmm. too. Like, when you're really immersed in saying, I really care about your opinion, then at different times of the year, I know, like, with the women, they felt like they could come to me with issues because you're just building that, trust with them that's that goes beyond a business relationship burton was always forward thinking on 
the on the women's side of things, right? Because it co it basically co-managing the the show is you the whole way through. But like it's so apparent that like it's just now that we're getting to the point where women athletes are supported through pregnancy. Like kudos to that. It's amazing. But I'm even myself finding wow, our society really programmed us with some anti female indoctrination hey like yeah but time. again luckily snowboarding almost had like a clean slate and you had women you know women were as much a part of the pioneering as snowboarding as men and you know i can remember the first u.s open where women were competing and i said to jake what do we do about the women in prize money and he's like well why wouldn't we pay them exactly the same you know, so and then and then I think what happened, or I know what happened was that, you know, our company, the people that worked for it, the athletes, we were pretty well represented by women. And then in that 80s, 90s boom, we were pulling employees and participants from skateboarding, surfing, and it kind of took on this male dominated culture, both as a sport and as a company, and I call that our second oh shit moment, um, you know, back in 2003. And it, again, it was Jake was sitting, we were sitting in a meeting of all of our global directors from around the world, 25 people, two women. And Jake turned to me and said, this is a problem. I think he knew like at a gut level, for Jake, it was always about how is snowboarding going to be here when I'm long gone? How is snowboarding going to be sustainable? And he knew that you had to have both gender and racial diversity if you wanted to survive and thrive as a sport. And I think you need innovation. You need different people around the table or you're really not going to be innovative if everybody really starts thinking the same way or coming from the same background. So I think he just knew at this gut level, this is wrong. Women have always been a big part of this. We need more women. And it was kind of like I said, that aha moment where we really buckled down and worked worked at it for almost yeah. almost 20 years now. And um, our senior team is 50-50. 50-50. Are you serious? That's great. Congratulations on that. Yeah. We went from under 10% of our leadership being women to well over 40% with half and half on the senior team. That's really important. Yeah. That's, yeah, I mean. It just makes you a better company. I mm -hmm. always say, too, like, if you do what's right for women, you know, we gave better maternity, so now we give paternity. Yeah. yeah, you know what I mean, yeah. and we and we give more benefits to young parents, That's and perfect. we're treating employees as whole people. We understand that they need to balance. So I I always say like if you're doing what's right for women, you're going to make it a better company for everybody. Yeah, and I think all the guys saw that as well as being able to go after the women's market. Yeah, I think that consumers can really smell fraud. Yeah, yeah definitely, <laughs> definitely. When there are a bunch of dudes sitting around deciding what's right for women in action sports. Yeah, I mean, I can remember that time mm -hmm. very well. You know, and I and I've stuck my foot in, a mouth, in my mouth a few times, especially with the younger women in snowboarding. Where you know, I think I said to Leah and Pelosi last year, "Hey, yeah." yeah it was cool to have jackets for women, but they didn't have to look girly. She's like, no, no, I wanted the girly stuff because I wasn't represented. And then even talking with Jess Kamira, who's a huge advocate for women's snowboarding, one of the greatest human beings on the planet in the, in the community of snowboarding. Um, she really just like basically took me by the shoulders and shook me and said, do you really think that women's snowboard media was for you? And I was like, oh, my God, I'm a 47-year-old man. This is last year with a daughter who feels very strongly about women's rights. And I just never had that thought in my head before. I'd always been that 18-year-old kid going, oh, well, the women aren't doing tricks as hard as the guys. So why do I have to sit through this and watch this? I want to see the best of the best. But the women want to see the best women. Like, obviously, it's so obvious once I say it out loud. And amazing that they're on the same course. Oh, 
Yeah. And I do think it's generational. Yes. I, I can remember very clearly when we made a commitment to really start making women's product. And this was around the same time. Like realizing who's sitting around the table makes a difference and we needed to separate it creatively. I remember talking to Shannon Dunn and Victoria Jalouse and saying, guys, you know, we're making like women's stuff now. And especially Victoria would still wear extra large AK men's black. <laughs> totally. She'd always have like a pot of coffee and like <laughs> sandwich and like, but I was like, girl, like we're making this stuff. Why are you still wearing the, you know, plain black men's stuff? And she said to me, you play with the big boys you got to look like the big boys. And there was some real pressure there. And now I think it's generational where these girls want to look like themselves, you Absolutely. know, and they want to be able to express themselves individually and creatively. And it took those pioneering women, though. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, it's a yeah, totally different landscape for Victoria than it is, you know. For Chloe Kim, it's yeah. a t totally different, a different space, yeah. and it's completely different in every way. You know what I mean? Like, you know, it's really interesting. Um, a writer told me recently, Julia Marino, said that when uh, she was growing up, she was quite a good soccer player as well as being a very good snowboarder, and considered becoming a professional soccer player. And her father said, "Don't do it. Women get paid." 30 cents on the dollar compared to what men make in soccer female snowboarders make the same oh, that's as great. men and i thought that's so cool wow like somebody is getting directed a young woman's getting directed into this sport because we have made a commitment to equal prize money and equal sponsorship and those kind of things yeah so it really makes a difference yeah absolutely i was speaking with spencer o'brien about um rider engagement in uh, contests, because it seems like before the IOC, there was a, a lot more, right, with the ISF building that it into the formula. It was rider driven. Yeah. It yeah. was completely rider driven. Yeah. It sounds like that they still need rider input because the courses are so gnarly now. The stuff is so big. You know, I, I don't think it's rider driven enough. I mean, I look at like the, the last Olympics when they had the slope style. And they had canceled all the women's ski events because of the wind. Right. And that could have been life or death. Absolutely. I, I, I don't know if you remember Anna Gosser's run, but she bailed. And it, if she hadn't, I mean, that wind gust, I mean, it really could have been dangerous. Absolutely. And I feel like the IOC is still not there and FIS is still not there with sort of having snowboard events when you would never have a ski event right well it was they'd canceled the men's as well so they're kind of going you know in yeah. the tier of watching yeah. it's let the women, women get yeah. blown off the course yeah, yeah so talking about the olympics how hard was it to back terrier when he was deciding he oh that was it? very easy we didn't really want to be in the olympics either really yeah that was not a great moment. It wasn't like, yay, we're in the Olympics. Jake's like, what the fuck? We don't want to be in the Olympics. We want to be individualistic, mm -hmm. creative. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the whole idea of being a team where you're all wearing the same uniform with the same sponsorship patches with the same coaches was like an anthem to snowboarding. And that was our original gut reaction was, we don't need it. We don't want it. And what do you mean you're coming in here to tell us right. where and when athletes should be competing? So it was really like the whole community saying, wait a minute, do we really want this? And, you know, it was right around the time of the X Games. And I think that, you know, the Olympics said, oh, my God, young people are watching the X Games. Big time. But they're not watching pairs ice skating <laughs> in the Olympics or whatever. Right, right. So it was like this unilateral decision. No conferring with us. Like you said, there had been an international snowboard federation that was very much driven by the athletes who would decide that, you know, the walls of the half pipe and the jumps and, and they, you know, 
And the IOC just comes in and kind of unilaterally says, okay, we're going to, you know, require everybody to compete on this schedule at this time. And we said no, and we ended up actually suing USSA. Wow. And it's, I think it's the only time I remember us like proactively suing somebody. Mm -hmm. And the writers boycotted. Yeah. And so we were very much, we understood Terrier, we got it. Um, and then, but we were like, all right, we've got to negotiate and make accommodations. And so there were negotiations where, you know, the, the, the athletes didn't have to become part of the team. I mean, what happens with the skiers is they become a part of the American team yeah. and they compete in Europe all year. Right. So you're not developing heroes. Right. Jake had this real, um, desire to create heroes for kids in the sport and it shouldn't matter if you're an american kid you might look up to terrier in norway right it's about his style absolutely and not about his flag right right oh that's incredible and we felt really strongly about that and i've never seen jake more passionate about making sure that the olympics didn't fuck up our sport really yeah yeah because eventually you guys would sponsor the Olympic team, right? Like, so the Olympic team was in Burton gear. Yep, we did the um, jacket. I don't know how I feel. I don't know if I would do it again. I mean, I think it allowed us to do some pretty creative things on a world stage. Yeah. But on the other hand, we are non-nationalistic. Right. And, you know, why should we do the American uniform and not the French uniform or the New Zealand uniform or, you know, like, right. we have that global community. I know, like, friends of mine who never really watch snowboarding and then they watch the Olympics and they'll say, oh, my God, your athletes, like, they do all love each other. Like, cool. you know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah, you know how yeah. you see, like, I don't know, maybe this is stereotyping, but I think of like women's ski racing where they're just like, you know, <laughs> like two cats at it. And and snowboarding, really, they do really like support each other and feel part of a community. I was talking to someone who was at the last Olympics and they said, you, you know, you walk into the cafeteria and everybody's sitting with their team mm. at their table and all the snowboarders are just hanging <laughs> out and the other athletes are like, this is so cool. Like, it doesn't matter what country you're from. That's rad. So that whole nationalistic thing yeah. is, yeah, you know, again, I think that it was almost inevitable. We weren't going to stop it. Mm -hmm. So we tried to make the best of it. Yeah, but... it was really big, hey? I, I, I interviewed Bertie, who was the, um, he was the head of the ISF. And he said when, you, you know, the negotiations with with the FIS guy was just like basically a guy eating a steak telling him like we're taking your we're taking your sport nothing you can do like non-negotiable but they I give it up to the riders yeah they threatened a boycott yep. and they were serious yeah and it wasn't just Terry it was all of them yep. unless you change some of the rules mm -hmm. and I think that the Olympics was faced with having their first Olympics and uh, not having the best Riders Absolutely. in the world. Right, right. Absolutely. And I think the riders, you know, they need their voices heard. I don't know if you heard the latest Olympic thing. Oh, I have no they've, idea. Oh, my God. They've added co-ed team border cross relay. Is that it? Who made that up? Who made that up? Who's fucking sitting around <laughs> in a room making that shit up at the IOC or at FIS? You're just like, that's not who we are. So I think we've got to keep our eye on FIS in the Olympics and right. make sure that, you know, that our sport doesn't become something that you watch every four years right you right. know and i love the writers attitudes about it the red gerards of the world <laughs> and the, he's the best you know just like hey this is another competition yeah. and and yeah. if i'm not having fun i shouldn't be here yeah he was and, like i'm i i was gonna quit this year yeah. and then my parents said well if you do one more year that he was just like olympics don't care for them. Yeah. It was just another contest. Yeah, like, and a lot of riders kind of have that. Not a lot of Olympians. Yeah, <laughs> I'll tell you. Yeah, <laughs> or I remember. Do you remember Katsu yeah. getting in trouble in in uh, Japan because he 
took his tie off and they're like, oh, you're representing your country. And he's like, it's just another snowboard competition. Right, and it right. made a big scandal in Japan. But, you know, that's what I, lo- again, I don't want to lose that mm-hmm. about mm-hmm. snowboarding, that we feel close as a community, not divided by borders. Can you believe how big the community is? Like when you were starting out, did you see it becoming, you know, the most watched sport of the Olympics? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No. And like I said, our first reaction was, hey, we hope that doesn't screw up our sport. Right. And I, th- I think the jury's still kind of out on it. I do. Too. I think that they, they scooped up skateboarding and surfing because of their ability to manage snowboarding in a way that made them money. I mean, and I've talked to Olympic athletes from the next generation, right? Spencer O'Brien. Um, it doesn't mean the same thing. It, they don't. But it's still they don't cool, know the, right? Yeah, I yeah. mean, it's still cool to represent your country and to be sure. able to showcase. I mean, one of the problems is they haven't had very good venues. You yep. know, Russia was one of the worst hot pipes ever and and they wouldn't use snowpark technologies which is what everybody uses for the x games and for the u.s open they have to do it their way they're not consulting the riders Mm. so that's a role that i can play Mm -hmm. of really just kind of staying on top of that and and pressuring the fis to do what's right for these riders yeah yeah absolutely man this has been so much fun talking with you i most of I don't know. There's so many things because <laughs> Burton's got such a rich history in every direction, right? From the early days, developing what it meant to be a snowboarder, you know, supporting the athletes. That's really that that must have been, you know, really difficult to go through so many um, great guys and girls and have them go on to other companies and watch your your star athlete, you know, either leave begrudgingly. Or leave, I mean, maybe it wasn't that hard. If somebody leaves and starts ride, like when Jay, Jason Ford talked about the negotiations and that there was just something that didn't feel right to him personally. And, you know, he gambled on, like, I, I think I could make more money. And then that gamble turned out, right? Was it hard for Burton to watch star athletes go, you know, year after year after year and start other I, companies or I mean I, I think what was hard was when the whole Nike came in mm-hmm. and started just tripling salaries mm-hmm. and we couldn't necessarily compete with that um, I remember that being a very difficult time saying oh my god there's more money in this but you know it's taking us out mm-hmm. of having some of the star athletes um, and then Nike pulls out. Right. You know, so. Oh, so the, yeah, that, they were weird. Yeah. They were really yeah, weird. Yeah, no, they came in and they really screwed up the whole pay scale. And and like I said, we had to let go some of our top riders there because we simply couldn't afford to do it. We couldn't afford to compete with Nike. So would they come back, the riders come back and go like, look Sometimes. at this offer. Oh, and yeah. And you go like, yeah. holy crap. We go, oh, you holy take shit, that. we're sorry we can't match it. Yeah. Yeah, you gotta, I mean, you gotta do you. Yeah, so I think that period in the kind of early 90s when that was happening was hard. Yeah, yeah. Well, they did it a couple of times, right? They came in, they did it, then they let those guys go, and then they dropped the whole thing, and then they came in again. And do it again. Unreal. Yeah. Well, are you comfortable talking about cancel culture and what's happened with Nico? Because you would have known Nico fairly well. He's a wonderful, beautiful human being who has, you know, been canceled for... I, I, I can't speak for what he actually believes, but definitely I can speak for myself saying, yeah, he, he needed to be canceled, unfortunately. And the latest thing with, with Terrier, kind of a really long, slow burn on that cancel f- for him. It seemed like he was going to make it out of it, and then it, and then it, it just kind of lingered. He didn't really want to apologize for what, what he was saying. But if you know him, you know why he doesn't want to apologize. He's of an older generation he's oh, european i also think what makes him a great champion yeah 
makes yes. him stubborn as a stubborn. human being. Totally stubborn. And, Absolutely. But that's why he was so successful at what he did. And he's so nice. I wrote with him at Lake Louise, and he was literally, you know, when people were on the flats, he would like, hey, l- grab my hand, and he would like slingshot people, and then like, because he's really good at, at moving around on his board on the flats, he could get unstuck. He's, he's a genuinely sweet person and he was with Burton for what 30 years yeah since he was a child and a close friend of of Jake and and mine I have to say you know I was thinking about this and there really was a moment for me when I realized that we had to have athletes who represented our values and not just the best and that was with Chloe Kim. And, you know, she was the best and we were supporting the best and like head and shoulders. And she was taking a year off and was very critical of the snowboard community, didn't feel part of it, didn't want to be part of it. Um. And I was faced with a decision of like, wait a minute, she might be the best. And she could probably take two years off and still be the best. Right. She doesn't no longer represent our values and who we are and what we're trying to do as a community and to be more inclusive and supportive. And I can remember some people saying in marketing, hey, it's hard to let go of the best when you kind of had that philosophy as a company that you're always going to have the best. And like I said, there was just really, I mean, for the most part, all of the riders had represented our values beautifully, right? Mm -hmm. But sometimes not. And I think that we're now prepared to say, if you don't represent our values, you don't represent us. Mm-hmm. And, you know, what a snowboarder says externally impacts internal feelings. Of course. Yeah. And there was some pretty strong internal feelings. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, it was really devastating for me to hear that Terry was off the team. I just, it just, there was a moment where I was like, okay. Does this have anything to do with Jake passing? Like, is there, was Jake like a gatekeeper that was holding the core values of of Burton together? And now there's some wild CEO who's just like, who cares about the past? Let's just cut these guys. No, and if you look, Kelly Clark is still on the team. And Mm -hmm. we're working with Kelly on what, you know, there are those iconic snowboarders. Unfortunately, the things that Terrier said and how he handled them made it untenable for us internally. Mm -hmm. We really had some upset employees. I could see that. Yeah. I I mean, I was upset. I was upset. Like, I chided him on my interview with him. Like, just, you understand why people need you to apologize, right? And he kind of just didn't. There was such an opportunity. Mm Mm-hmm. I yeah. think there was such an opportunity for him, especially with like Tanner Pendleton and yes. stuff, which yeah. was just so eye-opening mm-hmm. and heartfelt and sincere. And I just thought there was such an opportunity for Terrier to be that person who could learn and grow. Totally. From this. It's almost better to have a transgression yes. and then come out of it the other side being like, look, I didn't know what I was doing. Like, I really didn't know what I was saying. And, and now that I do... We really tried to give him that opportunity. Yeah. And again, maybe it's the stubbornness of being a champion and, and probably same with Nico a little bit, you know, just that stubbornness. His whole life being a champion, being a child, both of those guys. Yes. Like a kid that And like, it's, that's ripped. never easy. No, of course, of course. I'm, yeah, I mean, I like, I love both those guys. They're great but again, people. I think that we're making our decisions around athletes based on a combination of values and and what they mean to the brand. And you know, you'll see people that'll be around yeah. for a long time. Yeah, you know, Kelly's a good example of mm-hmm. someone who retired, and we're really working with her in different ways because right. they're still contributing to the sport. Of course. 
yeah, yeah. and they have that that designer knowledge that yeah. that thing about the love of snowboarding where yeah you you're really after making the best product in the world and i'm gonna hire olivia kelly that's for sure absolutely <laughs> yeah that's incredible well she's going to be an engineer like yeah, your dad she was going to be she right? did a and she just finished a one-year internship here oh that's so sweet yeah. that's incredible and for me like for her to be doing an engineering internship at craig's how, yeah. how incredible is that yeah it's that's that's too too incredible yeah. it's insane so nice so legacy is important to us but we've also got to be value driven Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and how has that changed in the last um couple of years with the with the big social movement the black lives matter thing where was it the burton store got got trashed pretty bad minneapolis in in minnesota right yeah and do you think that had anything to do with snowboarding generally being seen as like kind of a white no. elitist thing? No, I think it was just the wrong neighborhood at the wrong okay. time. And it was really pretty minor. It wasn't that bad. You know, I think we've been doing a lot around social justice with chill. I love that. With our environmental stuff. And we just haven't been talking about it. Mm-hmm. And I think we're now at a moment where consumers are demanding that they're companies kind of put their money where their mouth is Mm -hmm. you know Mm -hmm. and they want to know you really walk in the walk on sustainability really not just green green or or on women's leadership right or on racial equity they want to know or on the environment like are you really because i think that our government has let us down Mm -hmm. and people are turning to businesses for that change which i never would have imagined right 10 years ago the mo- you know the first sort of overtly political thing that we did was right after Trump was elected I said to Jake I want to go to the women's march but I want any Burton employee who wants to go to come with me rad and I paid for it or whatever that's awesome and I I remember Jake sort of saying okay you're prepared this is political and we haven't really done too much like personally we've been involved in politics Democratic politics, but we've been careful to separate it with the company because you don't want to impose your views on your employees. But right now we're in such a time where it's oh. just kind of right and wrong. And, and um, I think the employees have actually appreciated the fact that we've taken a stand. We produced a couple dump Trump boards, Jake and I, yep. and used it to raise money for causes that we care about, including protect our winners, you know. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of the role of business has changed in the last 10 years where consumers want to know not just what's the coolest product, but are you really doing the right thing for the environment, for your workforce, in terms of human rights? I think it's really important here to talk about how, you know, to an outsider, when you do some basic um, research on Burton, it looks like you and Jake set the company up, not not just to like grow a bank account, grow a bank account, grow a bank account, like as, you know, money driven decisions always, but for sustainable, you know, long term viability. Yeah, that's why. We never took on debt, and we never took on partners, and it always was about the long-term sustainability of the sport. And because we stayed private, we could invest in that, right? And we're going to need diversity if we're going to stay viable long-term. We're going to need winters we're going to need oh, <laughs> if we're going to stay viable long-term. So. I think staying private allows you to keep that bigger picture. And I'm not trying to impress the market with my latest quarterly results. And we can sit around as a senior team and say, all right, we're really going to invest in this social justice, hiring more people of BIPOC. Mm -hmm. We've got to invest. Mm -hmm. Is everybody holding hands and saying, (laughs) you know, we're going to take less of a profit right? so that we can invest longer term? And that's the beauty of being private. Of course, you're going to have people in your management team that are going to push the other direction, right? Like, it's not going to be a big unanimous, hey, yeah, like, let's do all that. Like, somebody's going to be thinking, like, hey, at what point do we pull the pin on this you know, philanthropic stuff and and start focusing Actually, on making money. Actually, we're expanding it. Yeah, because good. we're doing well, and you yeah. want to give back. Yeah, 
Um, and you want to be strategic mm-hmm. um, about that. So you'd actually be surprised. You've even got like the CFO like um, saying we should be even spending more money on philanthropic stuff. You Good. Know? Yeah. Um, I found a shortcut myself just because, you know, I started the show as a, as a hobbyist. I still call myself a hobbyist, but I'm sitting in the office <laughs> of one of the most powerful snowboarders in the world. I love it. Um, but I interviewed Steve from stoked.org, mm-hmm. which is another organization very similar to Chill, mm-hmm. which, by the way, knowing that Chill's been going for, what, almost 20 years? No, 25. Oh, that's insane. Yeah. Like, that's that's just... Who, who came up with the... The concept for chill. Yeah, that really was Jake and I. Like I said in the very beginning, we we had uh, bank issues, mm-hmm. and kind of once we started really getting profitable and knowing we wanted to give back, we really sat down and thought about it. And you know, we we did think about environmental causes, especially kind of modeling ourselves after the surf industry that was really starting to get into that one percent for the planet and mm-hmm. everything like that. And, you know, Jake said, we wouldn't be where we are without teenagers. And if you think about this, when snowboarding started, yourself included, you didn't have an instructor. You didn't have a school to go to. You got this thing in a box. You figured out how to put it together. And you're the one that took the risk on us and the risk and the chance. And, and Jake was very much like, that's the demographic that put us on the map, and that's the one I want to give back to in, in the context of those that wouldn't otherwise have the ability to go to go snowboarding. I mean, it's the greatest gift you can give anybody. So it really started as a learn-to-ride program yep. in Burlington, taking kids from foster care, homeless shelters, snowboarding, and then we realized, wow, you know, these kids are learning skills and um, developing in a way that's, you know, it's a youth development program that's using snowboarding as the vehicle. Um, so over the years, it's really, you know, it's become a world-class youth development program. We're in 14 cities in North America. We're expanding to Europe. Um, it's really, it's a really exciting time. That's super cool. Yeah. Yeah. So Steve convinced me that the shortcut for happiness is not acquiring things. Like if you're feeling a bit crappy, especially if you're feeling crappy because you don't have enough money, the moment you give someone else something, you, you realize how rich you are. I think that's what's kept us going through the tough times and mm. the good times is that you just do have this higher purpose. It is about something bigger mm-hmm. than you. Jake will tell you in the very, very beginning in the late 70s, he saw a get rich quick scheme. He's <laughs> like, if I make you know, this many thousand snowboards and sell them at this price, I can be doing as well as my buddies who got the banking job in New York or whatever. Right. And that didn't exactly work out that way. <laughs> and so he, he, he literally will say the minute he stopped focusing on the money and started focusing on what was right for the sport is when things started to change. When he just started to think, all right, forget about making, you know, 300 snowboards a week. I need to make as many snowboards as I can actually sell. <laughs> right. And I've got to figure out what people want and how to make it better. And, you know, he says revenge is a good motivator because, <laughs> you know, people were like, this is never going to work. Right. You know, this is never going to be a sport. This is never going to be anything more than than a hobby. I remember when we first moved to northern Vermont, like in 1990, some people invited us out to dinner and they just couldn't get over that we would work in the snowboard business full time. They're like, that's not just like a hobby. And we're like, no, it's a full time <laughs> job. Um so you had that kind of revenge, not revenge, I but you, you want to prove somebody wrong totally. and say, you know what, I was right. There's a sport here, and it's bigger than me, and it's about something more meaningful than just my bank account. And that's what keeps, because otherwise I'm not sure you how you keep going through the banking crisis and having, you know, to, to tell people that they can't cash their paycheck or having to lay people off in a global economic crisis 
or restructuring now under COVID. I mean, these are hard, gut-wrenching decisions, but you always feel like I'm doing it for something bigger, and that helps. That's really, yeah, and it's not shareholders, and it's not quarterly profits. Right. That's right. It's I mean, our community, yeah. and it's our brand, and it's the people that are helping us get there. Yeah. You yep. know, the only other time that we ever thought about, like, there was a time that Jake thought about going public because, like you said, there were some people leaving this company and going to work and they were going to public companies or, yeah. you know, Ride or Morrow. They all started going yep. public. And Jake was like, you know, the one reason you would do that is to reward those people who have been with you mm -hmm. and somehow give them a payday at the end of the day, right. you know? But at the end of the day, we realized staying private and being able to invest in things like women's leadership and sustainability and innovation and R&D, you know, those kind of things that the step on was four and a half years in R&D. Right. You know, yeah. and it's just kind of that burden, like we're going to commit and however long it takes, it takes. How's it been going? It's, it's, it sells out every year. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. The, yeah, I remember when Steppin first came out. It's good that you're calling it Step On now. Yeah, <laughs> you have to do push ups stuff. if you call it Steppin. Really? Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. love it. Totally. 20 push ups right now. No, you know, again, and I, I, I'm trying to institutionalize Jake's thinking, and I think we, we have, but it really was Jake who. You know, it was six, seven years ago, said to our head engineer, he was snowboarding with him, and he said, dude, I'm almost 60. I've been bending over for 20 years. Yeah. I can do it, yeah. but I'm done. Yeah. But you have to make it as good as my buckle binding. It's got to be the same. And yeah. like what a challenge that is. It's huge. Right? But yeah. again, Burton has the ability to say, you know what? We're going to put some engineers on this, not for a couple of weeks, but for a couple of years. Right. So Jake took a real journey from this kind of get rich quick thing, which <laughs> which kids have. Like yeah. when you're young, you think that it's that's yeah. you're counting money and you're going, oh, if we can do this, we can <laughs> we can make that. There was another pivotal moment, kind of in the in the middle, where I know he felt a responsibility from what he said for the snowboard patent not coming out to bite everybody in the ass, but he also had the three hole pattern, which was kind of you know, this non-industry standard thing. Everybody goes industry standard. Burton stays with the three-hole pattern. And at one point, try, for a short period, tried to enforce like, hey, it's patent infringement if you're making discs that fit our bindings. But that seemed to, by the end, to be like a moot point. I he think, never I went think there. It would, I think we'd call one of our biggest PR mistakes ever. Mm -hmm. I think, honestly, we wanted to fuck Sims. Right. <laughs> Bottom line. That's like it. Yeah. And, and the industry came out and said, you can't do that. Right away, we had said we were going to give the money to charity. Yeah, okay. And we're like, no, this was a bad idea and and i think a real mistake that splashback of like yeah. hey yeah i think i think from a snowboard community member yeah that uh, that to me i was like what are they do i didn't understand fuck sims i just was like you seem to be fucking everybody no, yeah, yeah no and yeah. it was wrong and we learned from it and mm -hmm. the backlash you know we have a community that gives a shit yes and and, and we heard loud and clear. I think Jake would tell you that was probably one of the toughest times he went through because, you know, I think he always prided himself on doing what was right, and that was definitely not perceived as he, right. He seems sport. very human, you know, yeah. You've, like he, he and approachable. Everybody says he was approachable. Every team rider that spent time with him says it leaves a lasting impression to sit with Jake, you know, yeah. because he was so such a fan of snowboarding like that that was a thing people have talked about um you know being places where they would never imagine being you know some ritzy place and everybody's in their jeans and their regular stuff and and somebody comes over and goes excuse me sir uh i'm not sure you're supposed to be here to jake you know what i mean and and he would revel in it like yeah. oh am i not i don't yeah. know do you want to check with somebody? No, so down to earth and <laughs> yeah. so much, you know, um, those those athletes were really his friends. I mean, I think it's amazing when you think somebody like Mark McMorris, you know, a 20-something from Saskatchewan, 
<laughs> and and Jake were best of like truly deep friends. That's you know? rad. And uh, yeah, what a gift! Kept him young. Snowboarding. Kept him young the whole time. Yeah, totally. The and what a time. and what a gift snowboarding is to bring people together like that. Absolutely. Yeah. So his dying words were that he had no regrets. Yeah. That hit me really hard. I think he lived his life that way. I think that when he made a mistake, he owned up to it. I think he cared more about people than anything else. Um, He was honest, he was fair, he was decent, and he had a fucking good time. He set the bar really high. I think he knew he was dying. Mm. I think he knew on some level before the rest of us did. Wow. Um, He was having an awfully good time. And one of his sons said, Dad, you're going really hard. Like this is a couple months before he passed. And he said, I'm on my victory lap. Wow. And I don't have any regrets. (laughs) The reason it sticks with me is that I hadn't thought about it. I'm 48 years old, you know? I'm going to have to start thinking about it. What (laughs) is my legacy going to be? That's a high bar. I think he put his family first. He doesn't. He's not one of those guys who wakes up at the end of his career and says, oh, God, I spent so much time at work. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the coolest things he did starting when our kids were little was he always took one of them wherever he went on business. So if he had to go to Japan, he'd take one of the kids. If he had to go to Europe, he'd take one of the kids. And they just grew up being part of the community, and and it felt normal to them to just be hanging out with us. And the company had started to do, you know, we didn't have kids right away. When we first got married and we're struggling, the business was struggling. So by the time the kids came along, we were, you know, we could afford to take some time off and snowboard with them. And I think that was his biggest joy, like the the family snowboarding together. That to him was like a perfect day. Where would he bring um, so he you had guys? His, he had his priorities. Yeah. yeah, he had his priorities yeah, straight. Yeah, he really did. And his friendships mattered a lot to him. And... um so I, I, I think at the end of the day, he said, yeah, I put the I put the right things first. That's so rad. That's so rad. I've heard, I've, I'm, no, I'm not going to blow up the spot. There's some secret spots that I've heard that he <laughs> yeah. would go to that I just, that really built my, as, as a fan of snowboarding, to know that Jake Burton had like resorts where he could meet people. And what people. he loved the most by far was going to a resort and then hiking like a ridge somewhere. He actually wasn't a guy for like a big heli trip. Right. You know, he would do it sometimes, but he much preferred, you know, to go to Mount Baker and and go to the top and do that hike that you do along the ridge or yeah. whatever. Yeah. And and we had a couple spots in Switzerland where where it was like that, you know where to where to go. So that that sort of just hiking the back country was really his favorite. It's amazing. Yeah. He he was a snowboarder through and through. Yeah. Do you still get out there? You still snowboard I quite do, a bit? I do, and I've learned, you know, these last two years. I never thought I could appreciate snowboarding more. I do. It's a it's so healing. Um, through COVID and stuff. So I never get 100 days. I'm usually like around <laughs> 75. or That's so I, many I, still. I know, it's still a lot, but I'm yeah. like, it's not as sexy as 100. Um, but I have found it more important um, since losing Jake and the pandemic. It's like the one place I can go and feel whole and connected and... So I'm probably doing it now more than ever. Oh, that's amazing. That's amazing. Yeah, the ride for Jake that happened at Cyprus was awesome. And some, you know, it was a bit surprising how, like, what a cross section of the community came out for it. You know, there's, I think, obviously, at a trade show, you know, you want to, people are fighting for their spots you know especially like if a nike comes in and buys your guys or you know listen to chuck barfoot go i could have done i could have done something but jake (laughs) stole all my team riders or whatever you know there there was a rivalry there for sure 
But, you know, in the ride for Jake Day, it was just snowboarders riding to honor, you know, the snowboarder guy. I think all the other companies were giving their employees a day off and stuff. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Like they were supporting it because it's just about that spirit. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. That community spirit and just having as much fun as possible. It's incredible. Is there anything else you want to talk about? I've taken like 90 minutes of your time. No, I don't think so. You covered it. You got me thinking of some stuff I had forgotten about in some That's of the really old cool. days. Yeah. Thanks for everything that, that you've done for the sport yeah. personally and, and with Jake. And, and uh, it, it's just been an honor to talk with you. Thanks for having me Labor here. Labor of love. <laughs> It was worth the 12 hours of flying yesterday. Totally. Oh, thanks, Donna. Yeah, You're thank great. you. Anytime. Thank you. Evan Rad shout outs this week to Donna Carpenter. Thank you for doing the show. That was a lot of fun. It's been just two years since Jake's passing on November 20th, 2019. Rest in peace, Jake. The HBO original documentary, Dear Rider, is a celebration of the life and vision of Jake Burton Carpenter came out last week and I highly recommend watching it as it features many of the voices of the snowboarding industry including Donna. Thanks Jake for everything you did for snowboarding and thanks again Donna for bringing us into your workplace and being so open and available with your history for the show.